When it comes to common knowledge about the role of Japan in the Second World War, by far the most famous association is with the dropping of the two atomic bombs that brought an end to the war in 1945, but far less attention is normally paid to the early successes of the Japanese army and navy, particularly against the European or Western powers of Britain, America, France and the Netherlands with their various colonial possessions. And that's actually what I want to talk about in this video, looking at why the Japanese were so successful fighting against the colonial powers. Before diving headfirst into this huge topic, a word from our sponsor Magellan TV. Magellan TV is a paid-for streaming service with hundreds of documentaries on a whole range of different topics like history, science, nature and much, much more that you can watch for a monthly fee. And today I would like to recommend a particular series, and in fact the first episode in this series called Japan's Gamble, the series being World War II in the Pacific, is really pertinent to what I'm talking about today and contains some excellent footage of the actual war and conflicts in question, which I would highly recommend you go and take a look at for yourselves. There's even a special offer for viewers of the channel if they go to the description below or simply follow the link try.magellantv.com slash history with Hilbert, then they can get a free month of premium membership. If it's not for you, you can always unsubscribe afterwards, but give it a go because there's a lot of really great stuff on there that I'd highly recommend and have spoken about before. Big thank you to Magellan TV for once again supporting History with Hilbert and for all of you for supporting me as well. In the West, 1939 is seen as the year in which the Second World War started, but the chronology in Asia is somewhat different. There had been a state of war between Japan and China since at least 1937 in the Second Sino-Japanese War, and arguably there had already been armed conflicts between the two in the years prior to this. Now, if we look at Asia, the Japanese had certain designs on many parts of continental and insular Asia, but the map of Asia at the time looked really somewhat different than today. This is because there were a lot of European and indeed the Americans who had colonies and control over certain territories and islands which they no longer do. There were British colonies in Hong Kong, in Myanmar, Malaysia and Borneo. The French were in French Indochina and I made a video about the role of French Indochina during the war and the specific Franco-Thai war there which you'll find a card for in the top right hand side. Whilst we found the Americans in the Philippines in nominal control there and the Dutch in the Dutch East Indies. The Portuguese also had two colonies, one on East Timor and another in Macau in the south of China. And these would be the main combatants. Now I'm not going to mention the Portuguese in this video, they're going to get a separate one because their status is a little different as is the French, but mainly I'll be talking about the Japanese war against the British, the Americans and the Dutch and their respective allies. Of course the Europeans were in Asia initially because these were trading outposts, it was very lucrative for them to get certain spices, of course that's the meme with the Dutch and other luxury resources, but these eventually developed and became colonies, although some would be just like cities like Hong Kong with the British or uh, Macau with the Portuguese. The Dutch East Indies were a huge stretch of territory of many, many islands that were under Dutch control at the time, but of course the majority of the people living there were, let's say, native inhabitants of these areas, and they would also be an interesting part of the conflict when the Japanese came. Now, the Japanese had been spared being colonized by the Western powers, and yet their interaction with the Western powers earlier on with of course forcing the Japanese to open their borders for trade after they'd been shut off to the world would be very important for how the Japanese reacted and responded and actually it's in this period after this occurs that you get a serious militarization and this of course fueled into the reasons why they went on and attacked all of these places in the Second World War. But first I'd like to go through just how successful and unexpectedly successful the Japanese were in the early war against these colonial powers. 7th of December 1941 is an infamous date in US and world history as it marks the famous attack on Pearl Harbor, the US naval base on Hawaii and the crippling of the US fleet right at the start of their engagement, an undeclared attack by the Japanese. However, what's not so well known is that this was also the date upon which the Japanese attacked several other locations in the Pacific, really starting the Pacific War in earnest. 
Some of these locations included the British in Hong Kong. They obviously attacked from China because they'd conquered the, the Chinese land to the north of the city and used that as a springboard to attack Hong Kong, as well as amphibious assaults on Malaya and on the US in the Philippines. And actually what they also did is to attack the neutral country of Thailand, again by amphibious assault, although by the end of the day, the Thai has had actually the Thais had completely joined the Japanese in an alliance, somewhat to save their own skin, you might argue. And so these were very important steps that happened on the same day as Pearl Harbor occurred. So it's a concerted Japanese plan to take over these areas and to cripple the US fleet at the same time. On the 10th of December 1941, just two days after the initial Japanese attack, they succeeded in occupying the US-held island of Guam. Now there was only a small force of American Marines on the island and actually due to errors within the Japanese communication system they attacked with disproportionate force when it came to Guam and so they only actually lost one man in the fighting although the US casualties were in the low tens counting civilians as well. The story would be slightly different when it came to the 23rd of December 1941 with the capitulation of Wake Island. The first attempt to take the island was on the 11th of December and involved around 2,500 Japanese troops facing off against just under 1,000 US troops on the island. The first attempt was beaten off by the Americans, who still had access to about 12 Wildcat fighter planes which they used effectively to ward off the Japanese, and so the Japanese had to take men and equipment from the invasion of Guam which had been completed successfully at this point and redirected them for a second attack on Wake Island which came on the 23rd of December 1941. During this attack the Americans were overrun but not before one of the American Wildcat fighter plane pilots, Captain Henry T. L. Rod was able to shoot down two Japanese fighters and bring down the Japanese destroyer Kisaragi within his wildcat and for this he was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor for his duty on that day on the 23rd of December but notwithstanding the valor of the Americans the island still fell to the Japanese. Given its size American and Filipino forces within the Philippines would hold out until the 8th of May 1942 but even this was a terrible defeat for the United States when they did capitulate after the final battle at Corregidor. And this is often described as being the worst defeat in US military history when they did indeed surrender to the Japanese. And it resulted in the capture of around 100,000 Allied soldiers, many of whom would later die in terrible conditions, either through beheading or neglect or tropical disease within Japanese internment camps and being forced into slave labor in Japan and to construct, for example, the, the, the railway between Thailand and Burma, um, which was another result of the Japanese and, and the Thai alliance that they signed between one another as well as 25,000 soldiers being killed on the Allied side during this campaign. So it was a terrible defeat for the Americans and for the Allies. But for their allies, the British, things would potentially be even worse. The British garrison at Hong Kong came under attack almost immediately on the 8th of December 1941, when the Japanese were also attacking Pearl Harbor and other locations in the Pacific. The Japanese showed overwhelming force, of course their forces had been involved to the north in mainland China fighting against the nationalist Chinese and numbered almost 50,000, while the allied forces that were stationed in Hong Kong numbered around 14,000 with there being a split between British, Indian forces, Canadian forces, local forces as well as retreating Chinese forces and even having some assistance from free French forces and others. Being outnumbered almost 4 to 1, the allied forces soon abandoned the mainland and retreated on to the island but with ammunition running low they decided on the 25th of December and the Japanese encroaching on all sides to surrender. They had only inflicted about 670 casualties on the Japanese whilst themselves had lost around 2,000 men and 10,000 had been captured after the surrender. Some even tried to escape and there's some very interesting and fun stories to read about some of those escape attempts and how far they actually managed to get, but that's a topic for another video. Culminating on the 8th of December 1941, the same day that Japanese forces attacked Hong Kong, they also crossed over the border from French into China into Malaya, which was at that time also a British colony. Now, the British had rather a large number of forces in Malaya and the attacking Japanese were actually very much outnumbered, advancing only with about 70,000 troops, while there were roughly 140,000 troops within Malaya at the time at the British disposal. These largely, again, 
being British and British Indian forces. Now the British thought that the impenetrable jungle in the north of Malaya would actually stop the Japanese advance in its tracks and that they wouldn't be able to get supplies and heavier artillery and equipment through and that Singapore far to the south would be saved by this large number of allied troops. But actually what ended up happening instead is the Japanese did get through the jungle they thought was impenetrable. They outflanked, outmaneuvered and outfought the British and other allied soldiers in Malaya and within two months they had already reached Singapore and Singapore would be really one of the worst moments for the British during this campaign. If you think I'm sort of skipping over why the Japanese were so successful and why they were able to defeat them, that's because that's going to be the focus of the next video because otherwise this would be a huge video indeed. So don't worry, I'm going to cover that in depth by looking at Japanese military tactics, the assumptions of the Allies and why they were so wrong indeed. But first, let's take a look at what happened on the 15th of February 1942 at Singapore because this really goes to emphasize the point of how successful the Japanese were early on in the war. Now the jewel in the British Malayan crown was Singapore. It was a center of immense economic importance as well as cultural significance for the British in Malaya and as such it had re recently reinforced against the possibility of Japanese invasion with a new coastal artillery battery facing out to sea to ward off the mighty Japanese navy. But but in the end, of course, the Japanese had fought their way through the jungles of Malaya and made their way through to the south to Singapore and so they attacked by land, which meant that these coastal defences were completely nullified. Now at the time of the Battle of Singapore, the British were still confident despite the Malaya campaign because they'd actually just retreated a lot of their forces that hadn't been defeated into Singapore and they'd sent new troops over from Australia to go and reinforce them and they thought Singapore would be completely fine. Furthermore, the Japanese were severely outnumbered by the British. The British had some 85,000 troops in Singapore, while the Japanese army only had around 36,000, although given the British didn't know there was this disparity in numbers at the time, although the Japanese were highly aware of it. The attack on Singapore began on the 8th of February, with assaults reaching over the river towards Singapore Island and landing on the northern side. Now, the Japanese were initially pinned down but they also attacked from the air and were able to defeat the RAF in a number of engagements who then retreated to landing bases on the Dutch East Indies to continue the fight from there as they could see that the fight at Singapore was soon becoming hopeless. On the second day, there was fierce fighting around the area of Kranji, which is in the northwest of the city. An Australian regiment did very well in holding their own against the advancing Imperial Guards, and on the 9th of February, they started a really furious assault against the Australians who were firing mortars and machine gun fires and inflicting serious casualties. Even the water was on fire as oil had been poured into the water and some had actually leaked out from destroyed tanks and this was set on fire and so you can imagine the kind of scenes that the men would have been seeing at this time. Nevertheless, the Imperial Guards were undeterred and managed to create a beachhead which they were then able to exploit on the next days and from this they were able to get onto the island proper and to break through the Allied defences. This was while there was a continuous air campaign going on as already said and civilian casualties were mounting and believing the battle to be over, the British called for a ceasefire and surrendered to Japanese forces on the 15th of February. Now what's incredible about the Battle of Singapore, of course, is the difference between the opposing forces. The British having 85,000 troops while the Japanese only had 36,000. And given that the Japanese were the ones doing the assaulting, they were attacking a defensive location that had been prepared for a siege, makes it even more incredible that of the 85,000, practically all of them were either killed or captured by the Japanese, whereas the Japanese only lost some 1,714 men during the assault. Now this would add to the list of prisoners taken from the British during the Malaya campaign, which was around 50,000, and at Singapore 80,000 more were captured, and many of these of course would later die of maltreatment and of, of abuses by the Japanese, and some were even summarily executed, like these Sikh soldiers from one of the Indian regiments, um, who had been offered to join the Indian National Army, which was a, an organization that was fighting alongside the Japanese for the, the liberation of India, and these were executed on site for refusing to join. 
Now, because of these factors, Winston Churchill said of the fall of Singapore that it was perhaps the worst disaster in British military history. So I'm going to end the video there because initially I was going to have this as sort of the introduction. And yes, you can imagine how long that introduction would be to another video, which is looking at why the Japanese were so successful, how they were able to do this, you know, winning against uh, potentially technologically superior armies and with certainly numerically superior armies being able to defeat those in the early stages of the Second World War in the Pacific. But that, don't worry, that's what I'm going to be looking at in this sort of part two to this, which I'll be uploading hopefully next week, um, potentially the week after that. Let me know in the comments below if you found this kind of thing interesting. But I think I'm going to call it there and then to continue about this another time so that people don't get too bored because I think otherwise it will be a really long video. And normally I find that the longer videos I make don't really get viewed as often, whether that's because people don't find that as interesting, which is totally fine, or whether that's the YouTube algorithm acting up and going hey what's going on here i'm not entirely sure but let me know in the comments below if you enjoyed this video i really like looking at different periods of history so it's nice to sort of get into some more modern history when i normally look at uh, quite a bit older history moving away from the viking age and other things but do let me know in the comments below if you enjoyed it just another shout that actually um, merchandise is now available and there will be a link in the description below to access that if you are interested. There are some sort of World War II themed designs-ish. Haven't really got anything from the war in Asia unfortunately but I'm sure there'll be something to your tastes there. Thanks again for watching. Do check out Magellan TV as well, the very kind sponsor of this video and the documentaries that they have and until next time all the best.